is, is we are a, uh, a corporate well-being platform, which basically, and I will say this better for the podcast. Uh, but but actually, this is pretty good. I'm thinking we can just go with it. If you, are, if you guys are up for it, you're doing, you're in a roll. I say oh. we'll keep going. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're a corporate uh, well-being platform that reinvents, reinvents well-being by making it universal, engaging, and accessible. So basically, we do this through our network of fitness partners, which are in-person gyms that you can actually go and work out at. We also have on-demand classes, meditation, uh, weekly one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions, personal trainers. And so basically a full uh, well-being platform to help support everybody on their fitness and mental uh, health journey, no matter kind of like where they start, where they're physically located. Uh, so yeah, it's a really great tool for employers to be able to use to, to provide that for their employees. So usually we give an intro who we are, but you know, Nikki Celentry was so great in terms of just telling us about... <laughs> Jim has, so we just jump right into it. So this is Happy at Work, and the whole podcast, the whole ethos of the podcast is we're looking to bring positivity into the workforce, trying to make people happier at work, and really explore the themes of how we can make that happen and speak to people like yourself who could kind of give some advice, some guidance, some tips in terms of what you do with Jim Pass, and maybe other companies could pick that up as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love this. I feel like not everyone is very happy at work and it's not always a positive place. So any, any advice or information I could give to help better that for people would be great. So I could start us off with a question. Uh, Nikki, it's great to meet you. And Tessa and I teach the Positive Workplace a Professional Development course at Harvard. And uh, prior to that, uh, most of our information has come from University of Pennsylvania's Master of Positive Psychology program, where that's where I spent COVID. So while people weren't being happy, I was learning, how do you do it? And I, I decided to corporatize it. And um, one thing that, that's really interesting, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty new field. And what I'm starting to learn is that culturally, on, on a global level, not everything is plug and play and, and works in certain areas. And and so my understanding with your app that is you know, people all over the world using it, have you found that certain cultures really like certain activities and, and certain offerings that you have versus other cultures that are like, mm, not so much? Any, any cultural differences that you've noticed where people really resonate with certain offerings? Yeah, I would say I, I honestly don't have the data on our fitness offerings and what people prefer. But from an employee standpoint, one thing that I found super interesting that happened with COVID is as we were beginning to reopen offices, there were definitely cultural differences in terms of who wanted to return to the office and who was like perfectly happy working at home. We saw our teams in Europe and um, our biggest office is actually in Brazil. Those teams were so excited to go back and to engage with each other and to like be present in the office together. And so when we opened the offices there, of course, we did it with limited capacity, social distancing and all those safety procedures. But those offices would pretty much fill up to the capacity every day with people wanting to go in. And in the U.S., we're like nowhere near the capacity limits that we have. Like employees just don't seem to want to go back to the office as often here, at least the ones in in New York, um, where, you know, obviously we're open so people can go back, but there seems to be a really big difference in terms of who actually wants to go back and wants to spend time in the office with their colleagues, which on, is really interesting to me. On that note, the last two people that we've interviewed, we've, we've been going back and forth with the different policies. And uh, what has your policy been uh, for the Americans about return to office or Zoom? What have, what, what's been the official word to the staff? Yeah. So we have the offices open, of course, again, with the safety procedures in place, like social distancing, mask, reduced capacity, um, and all of those things. So they're open on a completely voluntary basis for us. So no one has to go back. Um, we'll revisit that in the new year, you know, once we kind of see how everything is going. Uh, but even once we actually do have a more formal return to work, we'll never be back full time. Uh, we're planning to always be a hybrid work environment moving forward. I love the voluntary thing. The the last person we interviewed was running the, the most popular place to work in Mexico, and he did a voluntary, and eventually everyone came back. They got lonely. Mm -hmm. I think he was offering some goodies too, you know, yeah. some free, free this, free that at the office. And I'm curious, have you noticed that with the voluntary, more people are going to Zoom, more people are coming to the office? Has there been any shifting with people having the autonomy to choose? Um, I think it really depends 
on the location and also people's function. So like if you actually are physically meeting with people in the office in New York, for example, I think people are more likely to go back if they're going to have in-person meetings there. But for someone like me, most of my meetings are with people that are from all over the world. So I will go in if there's a lot of people that I know are going to be in the office and I can have some meetings in person. But if I'm just going to be in a conference room on Zoom all day, it doesn't really make sense for me to go in. So I think it really has depended heavily on the team and kind of what their function is, how collaborative they need to be and how they spend their days. And we've seen like our more junior kind of like sales development folks, they tend to go in more often because I think it's helpful for them to sit with their manager and, and like bounce ideas off of each other when they're reaching out to prospects. But for other functions, they haven't really gone in at all. But we have also done, we've, we've tried to incentivize people to go back with, you know, some fun perks like lunches in the office on the day that they're there or like organizing group workouts, of course, with gym pass, that's like a big part of our culture. So like last Wednesday, I was in the office and we all went to a soul cycle class afterward, which made it, you know, kind of more fun to get to meet people and, and incentivize me to go in. Thank yes, you. I think, I think you uh, had a question for her. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I had was around for on your corporate well-being platform, are you able to track the most popular services that are made available to employees and how it might link to work productivity? Yeah, so we definitely, we can track that and we provide that data. We can provide that data back to the HR departments that we work with so they can see what their employees are engaging in. Um, and so I think it kind of, you know, depends on wherever they are in the U.S. and kind of what the employee makeup is. It's kind of the beauty of Gym Pass is that we have things available regardless of where your starting point is in your fitness or well-being journey. So I think it really varies wildly depending on the company. Uh, but yeah, we do have that data available um, for people to take a look at. And in terms of linking it with productivity, I think that's something, you know, that we would, of course, want to be able to like dive more into, you know, as our product continues to evolve, because if we know anecdotally there's a uh, there's a connection between productivity and people being, you know, physically active and, and feeling better mentally. But we don't have that quite yet, but that would definitely be like a wish list item for me. It's also a retention and recruitment tool, isn't it? Because you were talking about, you know, uh, previously with me that you, by having online events, online workouts, online yoga, what have you, this way it gets everybody together, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I saw some data uh, from our team that was talking about, especially like uh, millennials and Gen Z, they, it's something that people really want to have in their workplace. They, they kind of see it, I think, maybe previously people saw it as a really nice additional perk and now it's something that people want even more so i think it's very helpful uh for talent acquisition to be able to talk about having that available for our employees and then once they're there it has been a really nice tool for us to be able to use to kind of engage people and bring them together where you wouldn't normally be able to because you're you know not physically sitting near each other and so we've organized all kinds of group workouts that we did, especially during COVID before people had the option, not during, I know we're still in it, but uh, <laughs> before people- No, with able. you, it feels like, it feels like we're kind of over <laughs> it. I, I don't want to jinx it, but it seems like yeah. we're almost there. Um, but yeah, so we did a lot, you know, I think people were feeling particularly lonely at the beginning where nothing was open and you couldn't be with anyone. So we had a lot of different fitness challenges where we brought people together and kind of force them uh, to engage with people they didn't know. Like uh, for one challenge we had that was called Refresh the Way You Move. It was like last year at the beginning of the year is kind of like a kickoff to the new year and refreshing your habits. Uh, we gave people, it was a contest with a point system and you earn more points if you were on teams with people that were from different countries and different teams. So finding ways to engage people to kind of like come together on different that are, that wouldn't normally work together. And, you know, they have like their own Slack groups where they're talking about what workouts they're doing and motivating each other to get as many points as they can. So that's been really nice. And then we also organized in the U for our U S team, we had something called uh, no shower happy hours where it was on, Friday afternoons during the summer and we would have a class at like 12 or 1 p.m. People could do it and then just sign off and, and get the weekend started a little bit early. So we definitely have used it to bring people together during this time. Mike? Uh, Nikki, so I, 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 I'm, I'm a huge exerciser. I mean, every day it's 30 minutes of swimming and then a, an hour yoga. So I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid <laughs> organization. Um, what I find is that the, the mental health benefits are actually more important to me, and I'm sure some others, mm -hmm. than the physical, you know, especially with, with what's been going on. Um, you know, I do find that the physical exercise is super helpful, but I'm curious, 
Have you, has, has your organization ever considered adding on more direct services towards mental health? Uh, and I'm thinking th- something more on the, the less formal, not medically licensed people, like support groups, people to say, hey, you know, I've been struggling with the loneliness or like this is my impact of COVID or I've lost someone during COVID. I want to kind of talk about it. Um, I'm curious if you just considered either support groups or affinity groups where people could just kind of talk about what's going on, you know, with an anonymity function. And, you know, we, we all know that the drug and alcohol abuse has really spiked because on Zoom, you know, you can get away with it. I'm curious if your organization has considered doing more in the support group space, like a little bit more directly. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I don't I don't know that they have considered that. We're working on, like, we're always kind of coming up with new ideas and new avenues to go down. I'll definitely recommend that. It is, it's interesting, uh, right? You would think, yeah. Especially, I yeah, mean, we, you know, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say with our own employees, we have yeah. tried to put things like that together, but we haven't done it as something that's a product that's available like to our clients. But of course we have affinity groups and things like that. And during COVID, we had ones that were more focused on like, we had, like a parents at gym pass one where people could share activities they were doing with their kids to keep them busy when they were all at home or, you know, different ones. Wait, wait, wait. So, so you would have it like, the, you know, the workers would have with their kids and other parents and they just do it online together. Well, they shared ideas in the yeah. Slack group, but we did have different events during the year as well, uh, where people could do like one of our uh, biggest partners that we have on um, the, our well-being, which is like more uh, partnerships with apps <clears throat> is called Neo U, and they have like a whole Neo U kids section. So it's basically like workouts you can do with your kids. And so we would have people say like, oh, I did this yoga class with my kid. And then they would share it to the channel and like make recommendations to the other parents. So it was a mix of like activities people were doing with their kids that didn't either were the gym pass product, didn't have anything to do with it. And then we also tried to do like different programming that kids could join as well, just like Zoom meetings and stuff. You, you did other really cool stuff too, right? Like other- Yeah, I like to think talk, so. What, right, right. You're telling, what, what are some of the things you were doing? Like, Baking online or what, what, what are some of the other stuff? Yeah, so we had a few. Uh, one of them was for, it was more focused around recognition. So once a quarter on the sales team, which I mentioned I support, we do different engagement activities for top performers. So each of our leaders are able to nominate people um, and then they can go and attend a fun event. So we've done everything from cooking classes where it was like with a professional chef and we just sent the list of ingredients ahead of time and people bought them and expensed them and they had everything ready to go. And they did a cooking class and it was with the sales leader. So I think it was nice because it brought people together from across the globe on different teams, but it also gave them that exposure to the most senior person within their function, which normally they wouldn't have access to. Uh, so we did cooking class, we did improv classes. Uh, I always challenge, I have a great HRBP on my team in Italy and I'm always like, Ashley, come up with like something really cool. And she always comes back with a really creative idea. So I can't take credit for it, but she comes did up you do the improv? improv? Did, what, did you participate? I did not. No. No. <laughs> that would definitely be outside of my comfort zone. I probably should do it for that reason, but I, I didn't. Tessa? Um, yeah. So, you know, kind of taking off the, the corporate hat um, for the well-being platform and putting back on your HR hat. Uh, we're hearing a lot about the great resignation right now and the labor shortage. So within your organization and knowing that you're, I think you said at the beginning that you really oversee or your function is really connected with the sales function. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing uh, among the, the sales uh, folks that work for uh, Jim Pass? And, you know, are you, are you seeing that you, they're, they're searching for other jobs? Have you had a lot of attrition or what's kind of been the environment with your organization? Yeah, I don't, I'm not even sure people are actively searching, but like everyone <laughs> that is working right now, I feel like LinkedIn is constantly, your inbox is just full of people reaching out. So I think even our employees who maybe weren't actively looking, they just get so much outreach. Uh, and a lot of it is really tempting because companies are offering great jobs and really good Uh, salary packages and things like that. Uh, And so we did see turnover. Uh, We actually kind of identified it first within our sales uh, function, actually in Brazil. Uh, And and so it prompted us to actually look at salaries. And so we have like uh, salary bands. We have a great uh, total rewards and compensation team that puts together very specific and like function market uh, focused salary bands. And so we realized since we were losing a lot of people that the market had shifted 
Um, and so we took the opportunity to proactively actually look at our compensation bands and increase them. And then we did salary adjustments for people across the globe based on this so that we were kind of proactively making sure that we were paying a competitive salary based on what the new market conditions were as a way to try to retain people. And I think like psychologically, it's much better for a company to just proactively say like, hey, here's a 10% raise for you because we don't want you to go anywhere versus waiting for them to get an offer and then trying to do a counter offer. Like, I think it, you just feel much more invested in if we're proactively trying to retain you versus waiting to get to that counter offer stage. That's such a smart strategy, Nikki, because I can tell you, I see this all the time with recruiting is that let's say, you know, uh, I'm getting an offer for Tessa and then the hiring manager or HR will say, oh, but you know what? Then she's going to be earning more than Mike and Nikki. And my response more often than not is like, well, maybe you got to raise Mike and Nikki's yeah. salaries. <laughs> like, and, and seriously, when I bring things up like that and I'm, and I'm, and I'm being very kind to them, I'm not like saying, you have to do this. They, they, they just can't concept. They can't get that concept. They're like, wait, wait, raise everybody else. No, that's crazy. I mean, they'll literally say that's nuts. We can't do that. Like, wait, why can't you do that? If you're losing people in a war for talent and a great resignation and you have a person, you know, you know, test is coming in. This is what the market is paying. Why wouldn't you do it? And they don't. Yeah. And so it's good that you're doing it. I think that's key because then people get ticked off and they're like, why, you know, so Tessa that may not even want to take the job because then she doesn't want to be the one getting paid more than everyone else. And they're going to not like her, feel uncomfortable and it's awkward and it just becomes a really bad situation. Yeah, definitely. And I think I feel very thankful that our leadership team, yeah. I think compared to maybe other ones have been very open to any recommendations that we're making around salaries. Another thing I think is important is having flexibility. Like I said, we're never going to be fully back in the office. And I don't think employees want that. And I think that's another reason why people are leaving companies. So I think we've been able to kind of notice the trends of what employees and prospective employees want and have told our leadership team, like, these are the things that we need to do in order to retain talent. And they've been super receptive to that and have just trusted us to be able to implement those things. Mike, Mike let, let me just ask one question. I know you, you have a question for her. When you say flexibility, is it meaning that if somebody wants to come in, they can come in. If they don't, they don't. So it's not like a hybrid where, okay, you know, Monday, Thursdays and Fridays, you have to come in. You just leave it up to the individual to decide? Yeah, right now it's just, you can come in as often or as little as you want, whenever. Um, when we have like a more formal return to work, we, I can't imagine that we would pick specific days. I could yeah. see a situation where we would say like your whole team is in this day and you're having a team meeting. So please go that day. But we're not planning on saying like, you need to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the office. And again, I think a lot of it is going to depend on the function because some of them, I think it is more important that they're in the office and actually like physically working together versus other teams. So I think it's going to largely depend on kind of like the function, the level of the employees, but a, a lot of those decisions will be made by the managers. So we're empowering the managers to tell us what makes the most sense for their teams as well. What, what do you think about that, Mike and Tessa, in terms of like the flexibility as opposed to the hybrid, as opposed to the remote? I think it's from the, from the other people that we've had on the show, it seems like you almost don't have a choice. That if you tell people, yeah. this is, if you wag your finger and say, this is what you're going to do, yeah. people are going to revolt and say, I'm resentful and I don't want to do that. I want my yeah. autonomy. I think it's great to say, you choose whatever works for you. By the way, we'll sort of like sprinkle some goodies in the office. <laughs> free, free lunch. <laughs> so if you want to get it back for a little bit. You, know, yeah. you get a little lonely. Uh, so I, I think that from what we've, it, from the interviews we've done with other people, that seems to be a great way to go. You have your autonomy, but you're being nudged, which you, you can yeah. choose if you want to have that. And I love the fact that your leadership is, is all ears open. You know, we'd love to hear ideas, but I'm curious if, if you have in place what the CEO of Aston Martin Formula One has, uh, and that psychological safety where people feel that I can call up Nikki anytime and be like, Nikki, I'm hating my job. I'm looking around for something. And, and I don't have to worry that I'm going to be fired or there's going to be retribution. Is there anything that, that you've specifically done uh, with the people working in your organization where they feel psychologically safe that they can come in and have a really awkward, uncomfortable conversation and see if you can make it better for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to think so. So I have some examples of things I think uh, we have done, but, you know, it's tough to tell exactly how people feel. But it's definitely something that we've talked about and how important that is for the workplace to make people feel like they're in a safe environment. 
and they can share, you know, how they're feeling and what they're struggling with. Um, and so, yeah, we, I think one of the biggest things that we talk to managers about is like this concept of, uh, assuming good intent or assuming positive intent. And so with managers, I think at the beginning, it was a little difficult for people to like, not physically see their employees and know they're working. And it was a little scary and unknown. Um, and so we worked with the managers and did things to reassure them, like assume that your employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you find out that they aren't, then we can address it. But in the meantime, like we don't need to manage people assuming that they're, you know, trying to like pull one over on us or get away with something. No one is going to feel happy um, and safe in an environment like that. And we actually saw, we do a, a quarterly uh, employee engagement survey and some of the comments actually said stuff like, I'm so thankful that you're being more flexible with us. It motivates me to work harder, which was like great for us to be able to see because then we could show it to the managers and be like, see, we know what we're talking about. Uh, this is what you should be doing. Uh, but, and then in order to try to make people feel you know, more safe, we've just provided a lot of avenues that they can give us feedback. So like I said, we have that survey uh, which is anonymous. And the tool that we use has this really great feature where you can actually have conversations with people. So if they leave a comment, you can respond back to it and say like, oh, please tell me more about that. And so you can actually engage in a conversation with them and they could see like Nikki's responding, but of course I can't see who they are. So that has been helpful. Uh, we've done a lot about our leadership team being a little bit more vulnerable with what they're experiencing and the challenges that they're facing, which I think has made people feel more comfortable and so, uh, for example, our chief legal officer, Ellen, she's awesome. She's a single mom. Um, and she had talked about, you know, how in the morning, you know, she might not be able to meet during a certain time because she has her kids then or is taking them to daycare or something like that. And she talks about how she actually blocks off her calendar to take care of what she needs to outside of work, but then, you know, either stays on later or signs on earlier or something. And I think it was helpful for people to see that since everyone is kind of struggling with these things and everyone needs to modify their schedule at the, every level of the organization, it's okay for employees to do that as well. And so I think that helped people to be able to have conversations with their manager to say like, hey, I need this 30 minutes for, you know, whatever their particular thing they need to take care of is and felt like it was safe to do that because leadership was also modeling that behavior. Tessa? Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that, it's so interesting, Nikki, because one of the next question I wanted to ask about was around culture, like, you know, the internal culture within your organization and how do you feel that's been set by leadership and what's the level of communication around culture? Is that something that started at the founding of the company and you feel like it's evolved over time? Do you guys, or do you feel like there was a m moment in time where you all took a step back and said, we have to reassess and and think about our culture. Um, how has that evolution been for Jim Pass? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always been a focus, like I think leadership has always understood like we need a strong culture and that's super important for us to be a successful organization. But I think it definitely has evolved over time. And I think that COVID has kind of been like a forcing function for that to, to make people feel a little, like to empower managers a little bit more, to, to trust in our employees more and to talk about these things and be open about them a little bit more. So I think it's always been on the radar that it's important, but I think COVID had us look at it slightly differently and in my view has, has helped move it in a positive direction. It's so interesting because when we speak to people, sometimes you get these, you know, to me, it's like mind blowing concepts that are straightforward. Like, so, you know, the, 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 someone like yourself would just say it like, oh, it's nothing, it's obvious. And I'm, wait, like the idea of positive intent, I don't know if I can test how you do. That's kind of like, I've never heard, I think somebody else on the podcast mentioned that before, but before that, I've never really heard of it because maybe growing up in Brooklyn before it was, you know, cool and hip, it was really <laughs> crappy place. You know, you, it was just the opposite. I swear to you, it was so different. Like you would be people and you would kind of like, like what's what does this person want? What's up? Seriously, like you would you would you would have the direct opposite of positive intent. You're like, hmm, I don't know, I don't trust this person too much, and it's such a crazy uh, you know concept to switch it around that you're just going to someone says something in the office, you're not going to assume they're being a jerk or being mean or what have you. It's just give them the benefit of the doubt. The, the positive intent is a great way to go. When I first learned about it, uh, was from a woman that was doing a diversity, equity, inclusion at Bloomberg. And that was her best advice that if someone says something or you receive a text or an email where you're like, hey, wh what? Before you get upset, you assume positive intent. Yeah. 
and then you then you inquire more, especially if you do have a diverse uh, workplace where just culturally, uh, if English is a second language and someone's using a word a different way, really just best to inquire before again <laughs> wagging, wagging the finger in that, yeah. you know, in, that in that direction. Yeah, we have, I have a funny story about that in Portuguese yeah. in Brazil. So our team in Brazil, apparently people say calm down as a way to be like, oh, hold on a second. But as an American, if someone tells you to calm down, especially <laughs> as a female American, I'm like, what? <laughs> so we had, I have like, I, I had a really funny interaction with a manager at a bar because I was like telling him how this came up with someone else. And he was like, I had no idea that wasn't oh my a God. And I was like, Maro, never tell anyone on your team, especially a female on your team to calm down because they will have the very opposite reaction of that. He's probably mortified, right? Like, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Now I joke about it every time I see him. So I think you tell him to calm great. down. Yeah, exactly. You know what's funny? It looks like we're almost out of time. And, and yeah. as we wrap up, I'd love to uh, see if there's if there's anything new on the horizon that you're thinking of considering that, you know, like just in the future, things that you're looking at that you think might make things better. Is there anything that you're just sort of brainstorming about? We might have some research that could be helpful to you. I'm just curious if there's anything you'd uh, be up for sharing. Yeah, I think kind of one of the biggest things that we're looking to do as a HR team next year is that, of course, as a corporate well-being uh, platform, our employees hold us to a very high standard, which they should, in terms of our benefit offerings and what we are providing to them, like in addition to Gym Pass, like they even comment like, yeah, Gym Pass is great, but what else are you guys uh, working on for us? And so it's like a push that we've been receiving from employees. And so we're trying to look at our benefits uh, as well, like in addition to gym pass and what can make them more flexible and provide other uh, things that are helpful to employees. And I had a conversation with someone on my team the other day, speaking of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she was mentioning that there's like a whole area you can look into in terms of benefits that are more supportive of people that come from different backgrounds. So like if you have trans employees, what benefits should you have in place to support them? And things like that. So I know very specific and focused, but definitely something that we're going to be looking at in the future. Um, so yeah, if you have any insights into anything with that, it'd be great. I'll give you one goodie and it's free. <laughs> 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 one of the best things to retain people at the office is if they have a best friend at the office. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So if you were doing these you know, events where people were just sort of sharing the ability. Like if I knew enough about you personally where we could connect and have a best friendship, like, oh, you paint too, or, you know, oh, I swim, you swim too. If there is that ability where we could create uh, that friendship, uh, then when it comes time to that great sweet offer that comes down the road, it's like, no, nah, Nikki and I like to hang out. I mean, I don't want to like lose, you know, just kind of like chilling out with her. Uh, so being able to promote that, uh, I think it's so funny because it's so simple and it costs nothing. It costs nothing. So true, Mike. It's so true. I see that. I see that all the time too. If you have a close knit group of friends, work friends, it is so hard to pull that person away because they feel they're being disloyal to their kind of core group. And even if they can get more money, more opportunity, it's it's really hard to get them out. You're so right. It's so on the money. Hey, can I ask one last question? And this yeah. might. This might seem a, a, a kind of a little silly, but when you talk about the managers offering vulnerabil vulnerability, where like as a Gen Xer, we didn't grow up that way. But I do <laughs> notice when more when I see millennials talk about if let's say it's a podcast or I see them on social media, they'll lead with just sharing things that I would have felt so uncomfortable sharing. But I guess I guess it works, right? I mean, is this? Do you notice a difference in generations where some are harder to show that some other leaders can't really give their weakness and softer side? Yeah, to be honest, we skew a little bit uh, younger in general, yeah. so I don't think we have like quite as big of a um, generational kind of divide yeah. as maybe other companies do. So we haven't, I mean, I think for some people, they're just uncomfortable doing it depending on like what their personality is like. I'm not sure if it has to do with, uh, with what generation they're in, but I think when you see other people doing it and it has a positive response, then people feel more comfortable. So, I mean, I guess my advice would be, even if you have people that are 
uh, like millennials at organizations or Gen Z that are sharing, like I would reinforce that it was a positive thing that they shared how they were feeling and that might make other people feel more comfortable to do it as well. And it's so funny, the littlest thing we had a, um, for our women's affinity group, we had a session where we were talking about engagement of women at work. And I was talking and I just said something like, oh, before I worked at Gym Pass, I always got through my to-do list. Now I work here and like, I've never had a day where I cross everything off my to-do list. And everyone was just like, oh my God, I feel so good hearing you say that. Like the more junior folks in the organization. And I was like, yeah, no, we can't like, it's, I never get through my to-do list. And I think it was like very empowering for them to hear that that happens to everyone, no matter how senior they are at the organization. And and it's okay. And you know, you're not always going to make it through that. So even things that you think are like super small and wouldn't be significant sometimes for employees, it's helpful to hear it. So I would encourage people to share how they, how they're doing and how they're coping. Nikki, I just want to, excuse me, add one, one point to that because at the, at the center of what you're describing is empathy, right? And the ability to kind of really put yourself in someone else's shoes, but for for people who are lower in the organization it's hard for them to really f understand that the leadership understands what they're going through and what they're feeling so when you're vulnerable like that it really it's um i think you know to answer your question jack it's you never mix the personal and the professional back in the 80s and 90s i know <laughs> so you know what i'm talking about right it's not i know just exactly me. It's, what you're okay. talking about because i came up through corporate america <laughs> yeah. uh when you know all my i had one female boss at my first job out of six managers and she wore a pantsuit every day because it was this persona that you had a yeah. to be like that was very masculine and and very professional and you never mix the two but today we see a much more collaborative environment much more empathy led leadership and it is about connection and it leads with vulnerability it starts with being vulnerable so i commend you, um i commend your leadership to be able to to show that i think it probably makes for um just a, a much better understanding between the leadership and the rest of the employee organization. Definitely. Thank you. Now, if people want you to join up, how does it work? Can you do it as an individual? Do you have to go to your company and say, hey, that's a benefit? So before we leave, maybe so people who are watching it and you know, when we tape it and then put it on social media, they'll get a sense of how, you know, how they can find you. Yeah, so it is. Uh, we are strictly B2C, which means that in order to be a Gym Pass member, you do have to come, or excuse me, B2B. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're B2B. So you have to go through uh, your HR department or your company. If you're small and don't even have an HR department, um, your company would need to have a partnership with Gym Pass for employees to be able to access our products. Uh, we do have uh, solutions for companies as small as like 10 employees up to, you know, 10,000 or more employees. So it doesn't matter what size your organization is. We can support you with whatever your goals are. And I think one of the things that's so great about it, just to plug it one more time, um, is that unlike some other corporate wellness benefits, it's super flexible in terms of the offering. So if you're like Michael and you enjoy swimming, which I do engage in, though I don't enjoy it, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Uh, you can, you're a runner, right? You, I do triathlon. So yeah. I, I primarily run and I just kind of like suffer through this swim and try not to drown. I am getting slightly better. <laughs> but, so yeah, so we have, uh, things that are available if you're a triathlete or if you, you know, only want to do meditation or yoga or go to the gym and walk on the treadmill. So there's just a variety of different activities and different price points. And the fact that the gyms are located everywhere or digital is available everywhere is really great for the hybrid work environment as well. So like when I'm, we have a house upstate and when I'm here, I'll do digital workouts or uh, digitally streaming classes on one of the apps. And when I'm in the city, I'll go to Pilates or spin class or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely, if you're interested uh, and you think we would be a good addition to your company, whether you're an HR person or just an employee who wants access to it, uh, go to our website, check it out, and then connect us with someone at your company who can help, you know, get that partnership going. Awesome. Now, now if, if, you, if you don't run a triathlete and you're not swimming hours a day, are you going to be like ostracized at your company? You know, <laughs> someone like me comes in there and I'm like, I'll do a little yoga. <laughs> I'm the guy who just does that circuit training, a little bit of crust, but I don't kill myself. Is that okay? No, or does it yeah, get very I'm definitely, I'm definitely the outlier. So yeah, it's awesome. really, we have this like running joke because my boss is kind of more along perhaps what your lines are. And yeah. she like, you know, goes to yoga and stuff and like, she'll go out 
and run, but maybe she'll run walk or something like that. And she'll be like, I ran for however many minutes today. And I'm like, I'm so proud of you. And then it's just kind of like a joke since I run really far all the time. So it's not an atmosphere where everyone's trying to one up each other, what they're doing, what, you know, how much weights they're lifting and things like that. No, no, definitely not. The whole, the okay. whole point of gym pass was to make well-being universal, right. And to make it available to everyone, regardless of their fitness level or where they're starting on their journey. So if we did that, that probably wouldn't be a good thing for us. You know, I bet you that one hour Shavasana classes might be really popular for people to just want to like take a nap and say hey i went to yoga <laughs> I think i'll I sign up for that I, I was gonna say nikki just to, as a moment of, of vulnerability and being able to relate to you i did one tri triathlon once nice. i too am a runner but I was so bad at the swim that I thought I was swimming great. But when you start to see the, the angels come out um, to support <laughs> you with their, their swim noodles, you're realizing, am I flailing right now? Oh, I'm no. not actually swimming. Oh, did that really happen? It really <laughs> happened. Like oh, all no? these three women who were like professional swimmers came over and they're like, are you okay? And I was like, I'm <laughs> swimming. <laughs> <laughs> but I must have looked so bad. So I'm I was, I made up my time on the run and the bike, but oh, yeah. Okay. That the was mic. the good thing is the, the further triathlon you do, like I do Ironmans and the swim is such a small portion of it. Like comparatively, you could be Wait, like not that great at swimming and still be okay. Yeah, how do you have time to do that? I don't get it. How, how, that takes, <laughs> how many, like how long is like an Ironman thing? Yeah, it's uh, hours, right? Yes, yeah, very long. Hours. Depends on how fast you are. <laughs> it can be up to seventeen hours is the cutoff. So if it takes you more, wait, than wait, wait, seventeen hours, hours at one clip, not yeah. like broken up. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it's a it's a two point four mile swim, hundred and twelve mile bike, and a marathon. So however long that takes you, as long as it's less than seventeen hours. How often do you do that? Um. I usually, well, there weren't any in 2020, yeah. but I usually do like at least one per year. So I think I've done yeah. six or seven by now. So congratulations. Do you have the Iron Man oh, yeah. tattoo? No, <laughs> it's funny because I have other tattoos, but that's one I haven't. I haven't I did, is that a thing? Having an yeah, Iron Man? My, yeah, my husband yeah. wants to do an Iron Man just so yeah. he can get the tattoo. <laughs> Can I get a tattoo for sitting on the couch and watching a lot of Netflix? <laughs> is that is that something? Is that is that part of Jim? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <An event>. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Nikki. We appreciate your time Thanks. today. Thanks. Thanks. This is great. I really appreciate you coming on. This is great. And you know, it's so cool because what you're doing at your company really coincides with what we're trying to bring out to people. So it's awesome. You know, and it's a good thing what you're doing. I'm gonna sign, I'm gonna look into signing up. I don't, we're a small company, so I don't know how it's, you know. Maybe I could go through Forbes and through my own company, but it's, it's cool. And it's yeah. everywhere, right? You could go. So like, if I want to go like right now, I'm in New Jersey, but if I want to go, you know, visit a friend in, in Atlanta, I could go and go to the gym there. And yeah, absolutely. Awesome. We have a lot of, uh, cool. like we just signed LA fitness is a really big one. Yeah. So obviously they're everywhere, but we have yeah. a combination of like larger chain studios, which are all over the country and then different boutique ones as well. Like, you know, independent yoga studios and stuff like that. So there's a good chance there's something that you will find uh, to do no matter where you are. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. 